Welcome everyone to our lesson number two of the everything you wanted to know about volatility but were afraid to ask series. If you have a good memory or just watch the video, uh, you might recall that we finished the previous lesson uh, at what I call a cliffhanger. I dropped you the concept of volatility and in fact I, I, I went a little bit uh, farther than I planned to and I explained to you that Volatility is actually the standard deviation of log returns. By now, you must know what a log return is. If you don't know what a log return is, go back and watch lesson one. So, in this lesson, I want you to learn a few key concepts. I want to take away from this lesson a few very interesting concepts. We know that volatility is a measure of dispersion. It's, it's a standard deviation, it's a statistical standard deviation. and at this point of the class, I am forking the class into paths. So one path is going to be kind of high level discussion of volatility with very little mathematics involved, which is this particular video. And the other fork, you know, the, 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 the other path on, uh, on, the, on the other fork of the road is a more detailed mathematical discussion of statistics for those of you that are really not familiar at all with the subject. I mean, if you have never ever taken a class of statistics and you're interested and you're curious, then you can watch my other video, which is kind of an appendix. Now, it's not critical to understanding all of the concepts, but it is kind of a nice thing to have. Now, if you understand the mathematical concepts behind, behind this, it will be nicer than if you don't, no? So anyways, but for this video in particular, there is no need for a strong mathematical background. I will cover the concepts at a very high level. Uh, the most important concept from the whole class that I want you to take away is that volatility, yes, is a measure of dispersion. However, there is not a single number for it. There is, you cannot ask, okay, tell me what is the volatility of the market. I cannot tell you that answer. You, if you ask someone, for the volatility of the market, is there are infinite answers. The reason is because there is it cannot be represented by a single number. Volatility uh, is a standard deviation, and if you remember the, that standard deviation operates in a population or on a sample of a population. So in the case of a time series, the population are log returns of different dates. No, so the only thing I can tell you is I can tell you the volatility for the last number of days. So for instance, I can say, oh, I can compute you the volatility for the last 20 days or for the last 100 days or for the last year or for the last 10 years or for the last 20 years. And every number is different because you have different populations. So the standard deviations uh, are going to be different. Therefore, the volatility is, gonna, is going to be different. So it's very important to keep in mind that volatility is not a magical number and it's not one quantity is uh, you will have as many values of volatility as intervals that can come up to your mind. Of course, there is no point of computing the volatility of the last 12 days. No, what is that point? So, so in the market, we tend to standardize at certain levels, for instance, monthly or annual or you know, quarterly volatility, like things that kind of map into, into intervals that are used in finance. We could also uh, use biweekly volatility. So as, a, as an example, so you, so you can see the difference. If I compute the volatility for every single log return since January 1st, 2010 until Friday, the value of volatility has been 15.32%. That's, that's what it means. It's a, it's a percentage uh, represented as an annual quantity. However, if I do it only for 2016, only for the year 2016, the volatility of all of those daily returns in 2016 is 13.11, which is lower than the whole period. And more interesting, the volatility since the beginning of this year until last Friday has been only 6.5%. Uh, so as you can see, 2017 is a very interesting year. In terms of volatility, it is probably one of the lowest uh, uh, years in volatility we have had ever. So we are basically down almost half of the total volatility in the period. So you notice how if I choose a different period, I get a different value. And 
when you talk about volatility, you have to attach a time frame for it, like, okay, volatility since whatever date, or volatility for the past number of days. I know some of you are curious. I mean, I know you love to do things yourselves, and I, <laughs> and I know that the, one of the imminent questions of everyone is like, how can I compute volatility by myself? If you want to go that route, I present you the easiest way. The easiest way is just compute log returns. So let's say you, you have a period, the last 20 days. So just get prices for the last 20 days. And for every day, compute the log return. The log return, uh, one easy way to compute the log return is take the logarithm of the value of XPX at the close divided from the value of XPX at the previous close. So you do that for every day. So that gives you the log return for every day. Once you have the list of the log returns, for instance, if you are doing it for 20 days, you, your list will have 19 log returns. Not because the first day doesn't have anything, unless you use the previous, you know, the day outside the period. But you have you have a bunch of log returns. Then you can use Excel or what is it, whatever is your favorite software, or even use a handheld calculator and compute what is called the sample standard deviation, which is, a, is, the, is the name of the statistic, statistic we want to compute on the data set. And it gives you a number, whatever is the number. But that number, remember, that number is the pure standard deviation. And remember that volatility is, the, is represented, is a scaled as a percentage, and is also always uh, reported as an uh, annual uh, standard deviation. So the formula for volatility is you take the standard deviation, you compute it, the daily standard deviation, and scale it. And notice that the scale has uh, a square root of 252 times 100. Well, the 100 is easy to explain. The 100 is the factor that converts this into percentage. But the square root of 252 requires a little more explanation. The reason is that uh, more or less, in a given year, you have 252 trading days. That's what you have. So uh, you have the daily uh, volatility, and you you multiply with the square root of 252, and it gives you the volatility number that you want. Why the square square root? Why not just the number? This has to do with the with very interesting concept. You now the concept of variance for the experts and statistics. You know that uh, the thing we compute is actually the variance, is, is the quantity that is computed, and the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. So when you scale, you're scaling uh, the returns from day to year, you're scaling the variance. You know? uh, so when you do the, the volatility, you have to take the square root. So that's why it is the square root. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You don't get the explanation. <laughs> Just use the formula. This is the formula. This is the formula all of the retail software uses. This is the formula that everyone uses to report uh, the volatility of whatever period that you have. And so with that in mind, I went ahead and computed a nice little example. I decided to take all the data set from SPX since 1950 and take off the log returns of every year and compute and the volatility for them. I decided to compute the the volatility f for every year, and it gives me a number for every year, and I am plotting the number. So you can see, let's see if that gives us any usual, uh, useful information. So in this chart, of course, we are right here. This is the dot that represents the volatility of 2017. And as you can see, it's incredibly low. Now it's low, 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 and you probably have to go all the way to 1964 to have something lower than this year. And of course, the, the year is just starting. Something can happen before the end of the year. But if this continues, if this low volatility regime continues, it's going to be the lowest since 1964. But then you notice this interesting spikes in volatility, and they are familiar. So for those of you watching, I am going to give you a little quiz. What do you think is this spike right here? That was a dramatic pause. The dramatic pause, the answer is 1987. No, it is, it is the year of the crash of 1987, no, Black Monday. And for that year, the total volatility of that year was around 34%, which was really high. However, 
Look at this one here. This probably is the highest, the most volatile year in the history of the market. And it was higher than 40% for the whole year. And will you guess what year was that? Yes, that was 2008, the subprime, subprime crisis. So this is when the financial market meltdown. Mel and notice how atypical the year was. So notice that we have more than 50 years here, like 60 something years of data. And you can see that two years stand out completely. And also the current 2017 stands out because it's too low. And if you remember when I was showing you the graph, uh, the log return graph, you can see here how volatility took a while to came back to decent levels. Um, and then in 2015, it went a little higher, but then it you become normal. Another thing that I want you to see about volatility here is that volatility is, it, it behaves similar to the log returns, and it makes sense because volatility is an is an statistic based on log returns. So you notice that volatility always comes back. Doesn't matter if it goes up, it tries to come back to some base level. Even if it undershoots, it comes down, it comes back, and it oscillates, kind of oscillates around a particular level. And so right now we are below the usual level where volatility oscillates. So we can, you know, use a roll of thumb. You just by using our common sense, we will expect that at some point volatility has to be higher than it is right now. Uh, because that's what it has done for the past 60 something years. Volatility always manages to go back high. So it doesn't stay at the level it always is and it oscillates. So right now we are under shooting the base level and we should expect volatility to come up higher. So I don't know if that will happen in 2017, but it will happen eventually. It has to happen yeah, because, you know, the data set shows that it has happened in the past. Now we arrive at another interesting juncture. Okay, so now we know what volatility is, we know how to compute it, but how can we extract meaning from it. I mean, if someone tells you, oh, the volatility is at this level for the last 20 sessions, like what, what, what do you make of that? So I have a little example here. If someone tells you the volatility is 20% in the last 20, 20 tra trading sessions, which is means the last calendar month, then the first thing you have to do, I mean, the 20% doesn't tell you much because remember there is an annual return. So the first time, whenever anyone gives you a volatility value, scale it back so convert it back to daily returns so we are going to come back to scale this into daily return and we divide by a square root of 252 so a market that has been 20 percent volatile is a market where the standard deviation has been 1.26 percent for the daily returns so what does it mean what is that 1.20 1.26 daily return, that's what it means. It means that it has been a market where most of the days during that month have seen moves up or down. Remember, there is no sign, it can be up or down of about 1.26%. So it's very interesting. 1.26 becomes like a bound, it becomes like, a, it becomes like the range. It has been that the market, most of the days of that month has been contained within that interval, the interval between minus 1.26% move and plus 1.26% move. Uh, and remember that volatility is a standard deviation. And for those of you that are statistic buffs, you know that Chevy Chase's theorem says that one standard deviation is about 68.27% of the returns. So it's a very interesting because then that means that most 68% is most of the time. No, half of the time is 50%. So 68% it means like a like a sizable amount of days in that period will be contained by the 1.26%. So uh, past volatility gives you very interesting information here. Another thing that I really want to drill into you is that volatility is not price, and volatility doesn't say anything about price. So I don't understand why. I have read in the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, and so, all sorts of interesting, uh, all sorts of uh, respected um, uh, media outlets, P 
people are confusing the two terms. Like the fact that volatility has been 20% doesn't say anything about what price is. Volatility only tells you information about log returns. That's, this, that's it. It doesn't, it doesn't tell you any information about price. It doesn't tell you the price will go up or it doesn't tell you the price will go down. Volatility is only telling you oh, how much the log returns have varied, how much the log returns have deviated from a mean. Because of that, and because I showed you on the, on the chart, on the previous chart, there are a few useful properties of volatility. The most useful property of volatility is that volatility tends to cluster. So the clustering of volatility can be seen here. You notice that low, if volatility is low, it tends to stay low. And if it goes up, it tends to stay high and then it can again low. So it's very interesting. That, uh, look at here in this period, for instance, uh, around the, you know, the crash of the dot-com era. You notice how volatility started to, to go up and it started to cluster a high value and then it came down and cluster a low value and then it went up and it took a while to kind of recover. So this clustering process in terms in more formal mathematical terms is called autocorrelation. And the autocorrelation of volatility, the clustering of volatility is very helpful because you can derive and an, a very useful rule. The rule is if volatility is low right now, it's most likely that it will continue to be low. And if volatility is high right now, it's very likely it will continue to be high. So at least in the near term. So for near term volatility, it tends to remain on where it was. That's the first useful property of volatility. The second useful property of volatility is that it's mean reverting. So what that means is if volatility is very high, eventually it will come down. So if you are good at this thing, you call more or less uh, compute an average time that it takes for volatility to come. And, and that's, that's one of the best trading moments of the market. For, for volatility traders like me, the best moment is when volatility jumps incredibly high. Volatility is very, very high. And we all know the volatility will come back at some point. So for instance, in 2008, it was a 40% and it came back to low tens within five years. So if you have enough capital and if you have patience, you can make lots of money betting on the falling of volatility because you know it doesn't it's not you make more money on that leg than in the opposite leg i mean like betting on volatility going high is the worst bet because you never know when it's going to happen notice that this high peaks of volatility has been separated by a long time from 1987 it took probably until 2003 for volatility to be more or less high. This is a long time, not like 16 years. Then for 2003, it took five years for 2008 for volatility to be high. And since 2008, you know, there is no money. <laughs> no money has been made on the long side. I mean, the volatility has been low and low every year. Keeps going, you know, lower and lower. Who knows where? And if you because of what I said about mean reversion, we know that volatility will become higher. The thing is, we don't know when. So if you are betting on volatility going up, you are going to waste a lot of money waiting for it. It's one of the most interesting bets. When you plan to, when you bet for long volatility, you will suffer time decay on your bet. So every day that passes, and volatility doesn't go up, you will lose money. However, betting on the other leg, if you are betting that volatility will will uh, come down, will reduce, you don't suffer time decay. In that bet, you are actually getting paid from time decay. So it's kind of like the safer basis, a no-brainer. If volatility is high, it's better it will come down and you can wait. I mean, if it takes three years, fine. It takes three years to come down because you're getting paid every year. Of course, you have to be really well capitalized and you have to kind of be sure that it's a high level. For instance, here in 2007, if I want to short volatility, that will be 
like a suicide. I mean, there is no, how much is left here? Look at this, almost nothing left for volatility to fall. And mathematically, volatility will never be zero. So, so we need to wait. I mean, I am just crossing my fingers that during 2017, there is some kind of global event or something that pushes volatility really high again. So I can chart it like crazy and get my new plane. So uh, those, are, those are kind of what I was talking about volatility. You now volatility is autocorrelated, mean reverted, and it, those two things, even though they are kind of high level, can give you an idea about future volatility, in particular near-term volatility. For, for instance, the assumption that the volatility next week is going to be similar to the volatility we have this week is a very good assumption, and it will work really nice. With that being said, here is another exercise. This is another quiz for you guys, because remember, this is a class, and classes have quizzes. Now, so this is, I decided to have a, a greater look at the year 2008. The year 2008 has been one of the most atypical years, as you saw in the previous chart, that the total volatility for the whole year was 40%. However, when you break down the year in months, you can see that there was a month in particular where volatility hit 80%. And that's the month of October 2008. So whoever was short volatility before October, it was very likely they was bankrupt by the time it hit 80. 80% 80, 80 volatility is, is a gigantic value. And I explained to you the equation. So mm, a, a, October have 80% volatility, and I am going to ask you, what does it mean? I let you think about it. What does it mean in terms of the daily log returns if volatility is at 80%? So the first thing you have to do is take the 80% value and scale it back to daily. Remember that 80% is a GR, is an annual value. So let's represent it in daily. If you do the, the, the pure thing, it's going to give you like five point something something. So let's round at 5%. What it means is, that during the month of October 2008, most of the days on October were trading in a range of 5% moves daily. And that's mind-blowing. So that means the market was moving up to 5% every day. I mean, it's not that the market was moving 5% every day, but there were days, days of 5% moves were common days. That's, that's the interesting thing. And what is a 5% move, a 5% daily move? It's huge. So imagine that in 2017, we have an 80% month, an 80% volatility month. What will that be in 2017? So with the SPX in 2,300, 5% of that thing is like 170. I mean, this is a, a, a 150, you know? It is a gigantic... Um, it is a gigantic move. So I, that what it means is, if we see 80% this year, we will expect the market to have very huge moves, moves of 150 p points or more um, per day for several days. How many days? Like 68% of the days. 68% of the days is a lot of days. <laughs> it's like 14 trading days, uh, basically. So. 14 out of 20, 14 days out of 20, the market will have huge moves. So um, some of you were present in 2008 uh, and you can testify, you, know, you can attest that the market actually had really wild swings during that month. The, the move is actually 117. No, it's like uh, my head is going crazy. But it's still 117 points. There's a lot of points to move in one single day. If, if the market moves 117 points down right now, we'll think the world will be ending. That's, that's kind of the magnitude of the move. So we have talked about volatility. And, and something that I want, to, want you to realize is that volat in order to measure volatility, the things have to already happened. So, so volatility is kind of a measure of the past, no? It's like you cannot measure volatility in the future. It's like uh, you, 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 volatility is a measure of things that have occurred. And so then it's good to talk about VIX, the VIX, something that you see mentioned all the time. 
uh, in the room. People focus on VIX all the time. I focus on, on it from time to time. And and the media also focus on it. So the media calls it the fear gauge. Is is really a cool name. I love the name, but VIX is, has nothing to do with fear. There is nothing like fear. There is nothing. Uh, it doesn't measure any attributes of that. VIX is simple. It's nothing less or nothing more than the expected volatility of the market. It's a, it's a future volatility. VIX is an expectation of volatility for a particular time period. And the particular time period that VIX measures is 30 the calendar days. So VIX is telling you what the expectations of the market uh, are for future volatility in the next 30 calendar days. Of course, a number doesn't come you know, out of nowhere. The, the number comes from option prices. In more exactly, it comes from the prices of XPX options. So VIX has a tremendous relationship to options and in particular to SPX options because that's how it's computed. You take, you know, those guys take the prices of every single SPX option on the range day one. They do some magical computations on them and a num it spits out a number. And the number is the expected volatility of the market for the next 30 calendar days. It's nothing about fear uh, and it's nothing about anything else. So right now VIX is around 12. It has been around 12 for what? Like the whole year? And, and, and it's a very low value. Now VIX at 12 is kind of low. We have seen VIX at 10 some in the past, but 12, come on. I mean, it, it, it seems to be that VIX cannot go above 12. And the question is, why? what does it mean that VIX is at 12? So now you have the tools. Now I explained to you how volatility can be used to analyze a past month, and given that VIX is a future expectation, then we can use the same tools to see what the future expectation is. So in this case, the same thing. You know, we scale VIX to daily, and because a calendar month, um, a, a year in VIX is, is 366, 65 calendar years. However, it only has 252 trading days. So that's why I have an, a start on the daily move. This is the daily trading, uh, the daily trade session move, to say it. So you divide VIX by the square root of 252. And in this case, it gives you that the daily, the daily trading session move is 0.76%. What does it mean? It means that the expected standard deviation of the log returns for the next 30 days is going to be 0.76%. That means that VIX is expect, expecting most days for the coming 30 days to be around 0.76%. Uh, and what is that in XPX points? I mean, the only thing you have to do is multiply. You know? <laughs> multiply on Friday, we close at 203,055. We multiply and it gives us almost 18 points. So it's very interesting. The expectation of the market, the expectation of option prices for the future is that most of the days, the XPX will be in a range of 18 points up and down. And I ask you, have that happened? Have we seen moves of 18 points up and down most of the time uh, or during the month? The answer is no. We haven't seen them. I mean, we haven't found the majority of um, of the moves within that range. What that means is VIX is overpricing the real volatility. So as you can see, because VIX is derived from option prices, options are always, always overpricing the move. So, you know, I, I don't recall the last time we, you know, it was probably so, so a few weeks ago that we had uh, 40 or 50 points. I mean, most of the time the market is moving like five points up, five points down, 10. If it, if it moves 20, it's a miracle. So that's what I want you to know. Whenever you see VIX, you can do this quick computation. And if you really cannot butter with the square root of 252, um, you, can, you can use 16 instead. I mean, you can round the square root of 252 to 16. So just divide VIX by 16, and it gives you kind of a, an, an, an approximate answer to the same thing. The problem with VIX, there is only a problem. I love VIX, and I love the CVOE for coming up with the VIX methodology. But it has a problem. The problem is 
that is only the expectation for the next 30 days. If you want other time frames, you are screwed. I mean, like if you want to know what is the future expected volatility for next week, VIX won't help you. Or if you want to know for the next four months, VIX won't help you because it's always 30 days. However, nothing stops you from computing uh, an arbitrary length VIX. It's, it's, if you follow the same methodology, you can compute an arbitrary length. And that's what I do all the time. I know you have seen my term and structure post. Uh, and when I, the term structure of SPX options is basically the VIX value computed at each expiration. So instead of computing one VIX value, I'm computing a bunch of VIX values for each expiration. So you can see in the chart, uh, this is for Monday, for Wednesday, for Friday, for 20 days, you know, for all of the days. So this chart is very, very useful because you can see the expectations of volatility uh, for different ranges. For instance, I can see that in the near term, so in the next two, like one, two, three, four, five, in the next six trading sessions, the market is expecting very low volatility. So remember, it's, it's expecting uh, volatility of less than 10%. You can go ahead and divide 10 by 16 and you can compute the range, how many points is expecting in the near term. However, you can see that, that it jumps, the expectations of volatility jump uh, above 12 uh, around the 18 day. You know? So in 18 trading day, calendar days, the expectations for volatility are higher and the market is expecting high volatility. And we have this really flat section here with, with high volatility, like higher than 13%. And usually when you see those expectations high and flat, means that the market has no clue of what is going to happen in the future. So everyone is just covering their necks, their behinds, as they say. So option dealers are really overpricing options because they didn't know what is going to happen. I had been asking uh, on the room about the meaning of this area and the information I'm getting is that it coincides with the French elections. I don't know if French elections are enough to produce this this distortion on the term structure of SPX options. I mean, it's a gigantic jump from less than 10 to more than, you know, to around 13 or more here. So I bet that there is some US centric thing also, but I don't know what it is. Well, I am not up to speed in terms of upcoming um, geopolitical events or upcoming uh, US centric events. But anyway, so when you see see me posting the term structure of SPX options. What I am posting is VIX values for many different time frames and it can give you interesting ideas of the expected moves of the market during those time frames. And now arrive, we arrive to the crux of this particular lesson. So this particular lesson wanted to show you that even though volatility is one single thing, is the standard deviation of log returns, there are, al there are actually a few types of volatility. So the most common type is volatility is something that you compute post facto. You know, something has to happen, it's something on the past. And, but the most important value of volatility is the expectation of future volatility. Because option prices are based on those expectations. So the past is really nice, and I know what happened in the past, and we know those things. Now we know what happened in the past, and it's good to know. It's very important to know what happened in the past because of the properties that I told you about volatility, this clustering and mean reverting. However, the thing that really affects option prices is the expectation of future volatility. So to differentiate these two things, these two concepts, then we use two different terms. We use the term of historical volatility or realized volatility to refer to the volatility I've been talking so far. So all of those values that I have showed you so far with all the examples before VIX are examples of historical volatility and I call them also realized volatility. So when you see those terms, historical or realized, you know that I am referring to the volatility that has happened. VIX, on the other hand, is, as you saw, is the expectation of a volatility that hasn't happened yet. It's, uh, it's an expectation of future volatility. And more exactly, because it's derived from option prices, we are going to call 
to all, all of these values of volatility that we can derive mathematically from auction prices, no matter what technique we use, those measurements of volatility are, are going to be called implied volatility. So implied volatility is a value of volatility that has been derived from option prices. So when you see me using realized volatility or implied volatility, I am talking about two different worlds. The world of realized volatility is a historical world. It's a world of things that have already happened. And the world of implied volatility is a world of future events, things that have not happened yet. Um, and in particular VIX, VIX is an expectation of future volatility, which is, 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 is easy to measure. No? So keep in mind the division. There is only one volatility. No, it's only one standard deviation of low returns. But in finance and in the world of options, you are going to see the two terms. You are going to see realized volatility and implied volatility. Realized volatility is a historical measurement. Implied volatility is a measurement of volatility that was extracted from option prices. What is the meaning of implied volatility? I introduced the concept, no? <laughs> so we know that implied volatility is extracted from ancient prices, but it doesn't mean anything. It has a good use. So curiously enough, before 1987, implied volatility of SPX options and expected future volatility were the same thing. And it, it, it was very curious that it, it was one of those cases where the two worlds were completely aligned. So if I derive the implied volatility from an option, that was actually the expectation of the market of future volatility. But it, something happened in 1987. As you can see in this chart here, in 1987, there was a major crash and a lot of option dealers uh, suffered a lot of pain, major losses. So from that point onwards, they started pricing options in a completely different way. So options were priced from the 70s when they were introduced to 87. They were priced in a way where the implied volatility always matched the future, the expectation of future volatility. But from 1987 onwards, that is not the case anymore. So be really careful with that. The implied volatility today is doesn't mean the future volatility. It means just that it's volatility that was computed from option prices. I, I add an exception. Things like v, VIX, the computation from VIX and similar computations from other, uh, other houses, not only CVOE, are very are mathematically robust and they are indeed expectations of future realized volatility. So VIX is the only thing, VIX and my term structure. <laughs> so VIX and, and all of the alike are computations that will give you an expectation of future realized volatility. Ho however, if you take one single option and compute the implied volatility from that single option. And I know guys that if you use your software, your trading software, most of your software will show you the implied volatility of the option. And you will get 20% or 16% or 8% or whatever. You will get one of those values that hopefully you know now what it means. But when you do that from an individual option, that number is meaningless. It has no meaning. It's just a number. That meaning is not that number. Sorry, is not connected with future realized volatility. So your option, your call option, has an implied volatility of ten percent. Yeah, very good, but it doesn't mean anything. That ten percent doesn't mean that that's what the market is expecting. Uh, that's what the option market is expecting the market to do. No, ten percent is is a meaningless value. You, the only value with meaning in the market is the value provided by the VIX computation, be it the official 30-day VIX or whatever arbitrary time frame VIX, but it has to be that computation for to be the expected future volatility. So I know that it's sad, no? I know that you see all these numbers and it's very sad. One of the reasons why it's meaningless is if you notice in your trading software, you will notice that pretty much every option has a different value. And that's right there is a big hint. I mean, you have uh, all of the options that expire next Friday, oh well, next Thursday, which is when the expiration is actually is. All of the options that expire next week, uh, if you look at the SPX options, like call options, you will notice that all of them have different values. And that's impossible, because if implied volatility were 
an expectation of future volatility, there is only one XPX index. No? So all of them should have the same expectation, but they don't. They have different numbers. What that means is that the implied volatility that your software is showing you is meaningless and is worthless in terms of using them as a barometer for future volatility. I want that to be drilled in your mind. Implied volatility for individual options is meaningless in terms of future volatility. The question then is, well, so, so then what is implied volatility today? And the answer, and this could be like a controversial answer for some of you, but the answer is that implied volatility of individual options is price, period. Nothing more and nothing less. So when you see 8%, the op is just the price of the option. That means the pri the option is priced at 8%. It's just a different way to express price. And so instead of saying that the option is $3, you say that the option is 8%. And that's it. There is no other meaning. And that's the reason why every option in XPS has different values because every option has different prices. If you see options with similar prices, you will notice that they will have the same implied volatility. And this is for the lesson for the lesson today. This is it for the for today. This was a high level lesson about implied volatility. I know it was a little harder than what you're used to, even though we have a little math. And there were a key concepts that I I wanted you to have and to take away from this lesson. The first key concept is the volatility uh, can only be expressed in a particular time frame. There is no such thing as one volatility. Volatility is something that only makes sense in, in a range, in a 20 days, 30 days, one year. You always have to have an interval for volatility to have meaning. The second thing is that um, the volatility we talk about is called realized volatility. That VIX provides an expectation of future volatility and is the only measurement of future realized volatility. And that any volatility value that is derived from option prices is called implied volatility and implied volatility has no meaning the only thing it means is price i know you are tired of, of hearing the word volatility by this time but believe me the volatility is a key component of options and that's why i'm starting this class uh, talking about it i thank you again for your patience i hope you have fun and as usual you don't hesitate to ask me any questions thank you